I'll explain that in a second. So my name's Ryan. I'm on Twitter, at Invoker. Uh, it's been a pretty amazing day of speakers and some great singing and great talent. Uh, to get the blood flowing a little bit, can we get a show of hands? Everybody throw up your arms in the air. A little calisthenics. All right. Great. OK, keep them up, keep them up, keep them up. All right, so little audience polling. Everybody who's on Twitter, put your hand down. Oh, wow. Everybody's on Facebook, put your hand down. LinkedIn? Google Plus? <laughs> we'll get you too. <laughs> All right, so uh, my company, Hootsuite, helps people connect and communicate on social media uh, sites like Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Google. And it's given me some really amazing insight into the revolutionary times we live in. I realize I don't have a clicker. <laughs> I'll get, I don't need it yet, but thanks. <laughs> Uh, so, it's given me some amazing insight into the revolutionary times we live in. Uh, over the past three years, we've helped connect over two and a half million people. And our product has been used through the Egyptian Revolution, uh, London riots, and Occupy. Our users include the White House, Barack Obama, and the United Nations. And uh, as a tool, we've been used to elect and overthrow governments around the world. So today, I want to share three stories with you. The first is a story about a revolution in communications with unprecedented velocity and scale. The second is a story about revolution in revolutions where we're seeing an arms race amongst technology. And the third is a story about a revolution in government where everybody's voice is heard. So it was August 2009. Uh, Hootsuite was nine months old. Uh, every night, uh, I lie in bed, pull out my phone, and have a look on Twitter to see what people are saying about our product. And on this night, I saw something really special. I saw the first mention uh, of our product in Chinese. And so I was pretty excited. I went, copied, went over to Google Translate, translated, and somebody was uh, recommending the product. And it was really cool to see. There were lots of retweets, lots of mentions. And the thing that I found fascinating with this is it doubled, night after night after night. The news of our product was spreading really virally amongst people in China. So like the Great Firewall of China, the Great Wall, uh, sorry, like the Great Wall of China, the Great <laughs> Firewall of China, uh, it was built by the Chinese government. And uh, it helps the Chinese government block websites they want to censor. So two of the websites that they block our Twitter and Facebook. And because people can't access those websites directly from China, they used our product to indirectly access them. Over the next three months, our site traffic doubled month after month after month. And then, all of a sudden, the volume went to zero. So the Great Firewall uh, had seen our explosive growth, looked closer, and shut us down. To me, the fact that a nine-month-old startup from the other side of the world could be seen as a threat to the biggest country in the world is pretty laughable. <laughs> but it really got me thinking about how scary social media can be for government. So there's a huge appetite for social media around the world. To give you an idea of the velocity and scale of it all, it took 91 years for the telephone to reach 100 million users. It took 21 years for the television to reach 100 million users. 17 for the cellular phone, and in just four years, social media reached 100 million users. Recently, Google Plus reached 10 million users in just 16 days. One out of every five people on the planet is connected with social media. It's higher in this room, as we saw. <laughs> and there are three times more social media accounts than there are email accounts. This is revolutionary change. We spend on average 120 hours a year on Facebook. And Facebook probably knows more about us than our wives and husbands, boyfriends and girlfriends do, because Facebook knows which of your exes you're face stalking. <laughs> so we share an almost unfathomable amount of data through social media. Each day, we share 27 exobytes of social media. Now, I haven't even heard about, about exabytes until I started digging into this. So an exabyte 
27 exabytes is equivalent to 27 million terabytes or 27 billion gigabytes. So that's a lot of iPods. We share that every day in social media. So to give you an idea of the human scale of that, if we took a piece of paper and we printed binary on it, zeros and ones that make up data. We started stacking the paper and we wanted to build 27 exobytes. It would be four stacks of paper that reaches the sun. It's a, it's a lot. It's, it's un unfathomable, right? Um, we're seeing an amazing amount of data every day. So social media is revolutionary in terms of velocity and scale. It's also a tool for revolutions and squashing them. Twitter and Facebook were heavily used to catalyze the events in Egypt. And like most of you, I watched them from a safe distance. But when people started to talk about tearing up banners for bandages using our product, I couldn't help but feel involved. And these weren't just the, the revolutionaries. This was also the government and reporters and everyday people. So like we saw with uh, China, the government blocked access to Twitter and Facebook, and people again started using our product to indirectly access those properties. Over a 36 hour period, we saw a 68,000% increase in traffic from the region. Now, this wasn't in my business plan, but it was pretty inspiring. 36 hours later, the government shut down internet completely, and we saw just a little trickle after that. It was an amazing event, and we, we were able to see a whole bunch of data that, that nobody else was able to see because of this. Uh, in the aftermath, we created an infographic, and we shared it with the world. Uh, we were approached by the uh, US State Department and the National Geographic to share it, and we were happy to help out. It was a big day at the office. So. Throughout history, there's been an arms race in terms of revolution between policing and protesting, between riot, revolutionaries and the governments they wanted to pose. So Gandhi non uh, repackaged nonviolent resistance. And policing evolved rubber bullets and pepper spray. Protesters evolved sit-ins, love-ins, picketing, and even critical ass. <laughs> Most recently, policing evolved the tactic called kettling. This is used in a riot situation. What happens is the police surround a crowd. Uh, they prevent exit or access to food, water, uh, or washroom facilities. It's controversial because it's indiscriminate against innocent bystanders in the audience um, or in the area. And also, it's been tried on human rights violation or allegations. Um, what we've seen is a response. So again, it's this kind of like arms race escalation. Uh, a group called Suke developed an app, and this is a specific app uh, that helps take user-generated data and overlays kettling sites. You can see this in the London riot situation. I'm not condoning the London riots, but I just found it interesting that a group created a specific app for this. This is used in a riot contest. It could also be used in a revolution or in a protest context as well. So Occupy has fascinated me. Uh, it all started with a, a blog post urging people to hashtag Occupy Wall Street. And since then, Twitter, Facebook, Apple, and Google have been the tools that have spread this movement globally and virally in a way like has never before been possible. The protesters are not just being covered by the media, the protesters are the media. And every Occupy camp has a media center, whether it's a, a humble data phone or a fully functioning field office. Overnight, we saw sophisticated websites sprout up, sharing protesters' demands and consolidating their efforts. There are over 950 Occupy camps globally. So this has grown massively fast. And the demands of the protesters are civic, state, federal, and global. And this is a real challenge for any government to kind of put their head around. When I think about this, science fiction writers have been talking about this concept of a global government for decades. And I wonder if, if 20 or 100 years from now, we might look back on this event as the Magna Carta event or the Boston Tea Party of some type of global government. So Occupy, 
leaderless, faceless, anonymous. Um, the Guy Fawkes mask has come to represent this. Shepard Ferry uh, even reworked his iconic Barack Hope poster to show this. This Halloween, uh, I ordered a Guy Fawkes mask online, or I tried to. I got an email back from the company two days later. They said that they were back ordered. It was going to take until January to get one. <laughs> they emailed me two days after that and told me that the manufacturer in China was completely sold out and they were just going to cancel my order because they couldn't fill it. I found it really ironic that something that's come to symbolize freedom of speech uh, is being manufactured in a country where censorship is the norm. <laughs> so social media is revolutionary in velocity and scale. It's being used as a tool for revolutions and the effect this is going to have on government is massive. So June 1st of last year was a pretty bittersweet day at the office. For some reason, the Great Firewall dropped, and we started to see Chinese traffic again. Uh, we sent them a, a hello message. Um, people started retweeting, resuggesting, and it was really exciting to see the passion that was there. We saw thousands of messages that day. At the end of the day, the Great Firewall kicked in again, and unfortunately, we were shut down. It was pretty sad to see. So we all know that a billion users is cool, and Facebook is almost there with 800 million globally, but social networks in China are no slouches. Each of the top three websites have more users than Facebook's 160 million domestic US users. Combined, the top three websites have more users than Facebook's 800 million users. And social media is still a really thorny issue in China. Recently, a bullet train crashed in Wenzhou province. 40 people died. In response to the government inactivity on this, there were over 10 million posts to one of the top websites. That was within a couple of days. And in response to government pressure, the website hired over 1,000 censors and editors. And what I find interesting about this is although the government has a technology and could shut down the website, they didn't. And I think the reason here is that it's gotten too big. They can't. So like we've seen in Egypt, in London, and Occupy, geeks are resourceful and they'll find ways to get information out. There are already holes in the Great Firewall. VPN, Tor, Cloaking, and Proxy are a name of the few. Um, and, and it's inevitable that some of the four million engineers there are already looking for workarounds. I love this picture. Apparently, I'm not the only one who loves it. Um, it's beautiful. Uh, so more recently, back home, uh, Canucks lost a hockey game. Mayhem ensued. There were, the actions of the, of the rioters were documented by hundreds of citizens. And Overnight, Twitter and Facebook were used to consolidate the evidence and spark cleanup efforts. For decades, we were worried about Big Brother, but in, in this situation, we've become the keepers of our own accountability. This riot wasn't a revolution, but the way that social media tools were used in the judicial process was very revolutionary. So, in conclusion, we are all connected in a way like never before. <laughs> our thoughts, our thoughts are global and real time. And governments who don't understand this will become obsolete. We each have a direct line of communication. And my question to you all today is how are you going to use it? Thank you.